we go through that put our fire down So 
That is what I'm, and that is the price that we pay. There's so many things that we want, so many things that we, we have to have, and we have to lay those things down until you come to that place in your life where you have nothing more to live for except that the will of God be done in your life. It's no longer for houses. It's no longer for education. It's not no longer for husband or wife. It's no longer for self. It's all about Jesus and nothing less. You would live or you would die because you want more of what chapter 5 is talking about. Let's, let's look at chapter 5 of Galatians. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free. Stand fast and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, before we could even get into not my will, but I will be done, let me make it very clear to you. When we, before we become born again, we don't have a free will to actually do God's will. We don't have that. We might be good people. We might do good things. And sometimes we might be, uh, but our heart condition is normally to do evil continually. But because we are, you know, we're, we're people of both worlds, we can do good and we can choose to do evil. We have both natures inside of us. But there is a stand fast. There's a place that we stand in God when we become born again. And it's a righteousness consciousness. I have, it becomes easy to do that which is right. Your mind wants to do that which is right. When evil comes, it's very obvious to you that this is evil and this is not what I want to do. And that does not mean that sometimes we do not fall short of the glory of God. But when we do fall short, there is something in us that continually come up against us and say, that was wrong, you need to repent. There's a voice from the Spirit of God that will speak to us. So I want to make that very clear, that you don't have the power within yourself to make one here gray or black. You don't have the power within yourself to live one hour beyond the time that the Lord, please keep all questions for after the lesson. You don't have the power to do any of these things except that you have the Holy Spirit. And um, I'm not going to go into how to receive the Holy Spirit, but that's important. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you need to find out how to become Holy Spirit filled. And, and um, so that's not the lesson that we're on today. We're talking about not my will, thy will be done. Walking in the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, what must be manifested when we are in the Spirit. So, so stand fast. But you, again, you cannot stand fast unless you are born again. Your nature is continuously evil, as Genesis talks about. It is in man's spirit to do evil all the time. Even when we do good, we have a, normally a bad motive. We have something that we want out of some kind of manipulation, some kind of something that will benefit our flesh. So until we are born again, we are fleshly men. We are not spiritual. We don't have that spiritual consciousness. That means the Holy Spirit has not come into our lives and have not taken control of our mind, our souls, and our bodies and beginning to groom us and help us to grow in the stature and the admonition of the Lord Jesus. So, verse 2 says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So it is not something in the natural that you must do in order that God's will be done in your life. It's not circumcision. It's not you're going to cut 
you know, the foreskin of your flesh, and that's going to make the Holy Spirit take control of your life. That is not the way God said for it to be done. So being circumcised, and he was speaking to the Jewish population there, is not going to do it. So as I speak to you today from in, in the 21st century, I'm saying to you, your good works, because they're tainted with bad motives, will not do it. Because that's something fleshly, it's external, it's outside, it's something you do with your mind and not with the spirit of God. It's not spirit led. So that's what Paul is trying to make clear because in, in, during the time that Paul was preaching, uh, many of the Jews believed that you know it was my offering, the mint, the, the, or the um, um, whatever it was that I brought to, to the temple. That would make me holy. So, but I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So there are two systems, even in the Jewish, uh, with the Jews. There is the law, which requires you to do a lot of things, which is external again. But Paul is saying here, if you want to go by that particular system, by do how, how well you're doing, how much you pray, how much you fast. If you want to go by the law, your holy works, then you're required to do every tittle, every word that's written in the word of God. And we know that no one can fulfill the law. So you will be fighting a losing battle. And he's testifying here. So he says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. So if you say that you are justified by the law, then you do not need Christ. You do not need the Holy Spirit. Ye are fallen from grace. If you have another way to get to heaven other than the Holy Spirit, then you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, Wait for hope of righteousness by faith. So how is it that I can get the Holy Spirit and be led by the Holy Spirit? First, I must be saved and be born again. Secondly, I must walk by faith, believing God. And this is why I started off by talking about how difficult it is. There is a price to pay for the anointing, for the faith that moves mountains. There is a price to pay for that, and it's because we must, everything does not always go the way we want them to go. We might not have the money to do what God is calling us to do. We must walk by faith. The faith that is in the word of God that says if God said it, then it is so and it shall be done. That is the faith of God. And everything we receive by the Holy Ghost must be done by faith. Because if you look at Matthew eleven twenty three, 23, it says, Whatsoever ye desire... Whatsoever you desire in this world, he did not say go to the bank. He didn't say go and ask someone for it. He said, ask, believe that you receive, and it shall be done for you. He said if you speak to this mountain and say, be thou removed and cast into the sea, it shall be so. But Listen to what I just said. Listen to Mark 11 and Mark uh, 11, 23 and Mark 11, 24. Those are the things that we're talking about. It takes really getting to know the Lord, dying to my will before I can truly believe whatever the Lord says, it will be so. Who will believe that if you speak to the mountain, whatever the mountain is in your life, if you speak to that mountain and say, be moved and cast into the sea, it shall be so. How many of us have spoken to the mountain and it did not move? We did not have the faith of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit operating in us to have the power to make the mountain move. Not that you're going to move 
the mountain, but the God that is in you is greater than the mountain, and he will move the mountain for you by faith. So this is what Paul is testifying unto today. But Christ has become of no effect unto you. you. Christ has no power in your life. The prayer goes unanswered. Not because Christ did not want to perform his word and his promise unto you, but because you will not die to your will. You want to do it your way. And until you make a separation between your flesh and the spirit of God, until you make a decision that I'm going to die and I'm going to let the spirit of God lead. Because when I live, I want to do my will. Whatsoever I desire, not what the word of God desire, not what the word of God teaches me, not what God wants to do in my life. I want to do it my way. I'm like Frank Sinatra. I want to say I did it my way. When that final curtain goes down, I did it my way. But see, when you do it your way, you will have your results. But when you do it the God way, the Holy Spirit in you will make these 66 books of the Bible come to life in your life and you will have power, you will have anointing. And when you speak to that mountain and say, be thou removed and cast into the sea, it shall be so. When the storm comes, you'll be able to stand. You will be able to stand as the word says, stand fast, therefore. When people talk about you or mistreat you, you won't be in your emotions. Now that's a battle that I'm still fighting. Because pain is real. Pain is real. Being hurt is real. The trials and tribulations of life, they're real. But when you get dead men don't feel, dead men don't get angry, dead men don't do things in their flesh, they're not adulterers, they're not backbiters, they're not gossipers, dead men don't do these things. And the Holy Spirit, when he is in us and leading us, he will lead us into all righteousness. So Christ has become unto you of no effect. Whosoever of you who are justified by the law, ye are fallen for grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, by faith, by faith which operates in love. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. You see, time, the times have changed. Today it's not about, you know, are you circumcised? Are you not circumcised? Are you a Jew? Or are you a Gentile? It's not about that. The argument has changed. But yet these words are written for our acknowledgement, for our learning, and for our growth in the gospel so that we may profit with all. These words are written here. Today we are not in the churches. We're not going door to door speaking to people about are you circumcised, are you not circumcised? That is not the question today. Just to show you how the enemy sometimes, depending on what time, what dispen what, what um, dispensation of time that we are in, there's different tricks that the enemy play with us. And people get stuck on foolishness. They get stuck on things like, I don't believe in God. I don't believe there's a, there's a, a you know, a life after death. And those are the conversations and, and the trickery that the enemy is playing these days. I believe I can do whatever I want to. I'm still going to heaven. These are the trickeries. We're not talking about circumcision and uncircumcision anymore. We're talking about people saying there is no God. I'm an atheist. They're saying there's no life after death. They're saying a lot of things that are lies from the pit of hell. Back then, this was a lie that was popular. This was a lie that was taking people to the pit of hell. But today, we've come up with new arguments. We've come up with new lies. We've come up with greasy grace. We've come up with all things except what the word of God teaches and preaches so that we might have life and have it for everlasting and have everlasting life. You did run well. Who did hinder you? You knew the truth when you got saved. Someone told you the truth. That's why you came to Christ. So you were doing well. Who came up to you and told you now that there is no God? Who came up to you now and told you you can do whatever you want to do and that is a contrary to the word of God, the works of the flesh, that you can live in the flesh and yet you are still in the spirit? Who came and told you these things when you were running so well before? How is it that you have left the race? 
and have forgotten what you first learned in the beginning? How is it that now you're focused on whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised when you begun in the spirit and now you've left the spirit and gone into the flesh? This persuasion cometh not of him that called you. This does not come of Jesus Christ who called you. This persuasion, you've been falsely persuaded into a lie. You've been falsely, you've been falsely convinced of a lie. A little leaven leaven it, the whole lump. All it takes is wrong, one wrong ideology that is incorrect. All it takes is persuade, you know, using your logic and coming up with thoughts that are contrary to the word of God and being and justifying yourself. Having justification for what you do. Oh, God doesn't mind. Oh, I only did it once. Oh, I'll just repent after I do it. <laughs> Joseph, that's not funny. You know, I'll just repent after I do it. I'm a Christian. You know, God will forgive me. And I can just live my life like that. Continue to sin. You know, like Paul says, you know, uh, the more I sin, the more grace will abound. Don't trick yourselves. Don't fall for the lie. The lie is not circumcision or uncircumcision anymore. But uncircumcision and circumcision was sending a lot of Jews to the pit of hell. They bought the lie. Today, no one cares about circumcision and uncircumcision. It is very clear today that this is not the way to heaven. It's very clear. And maybe a, several generations from now, it will be very clear that there is an afterlife. Science will be able to prove that when you die, you are going to heaven or hell. But it will be too late for this generation. So this is why I'm coming to you and saying, wake up. I'm sounding the alarm today. Wake up out of your sleep. You who are slumbering, you who are walking as zombies and living dead, wake up as the alarm is being sounded in the name of Jesus. See, he says, a little leaven, a little lie, a little false teaching, a little wrong thinking will mess up the entire lump. The entire dough will be leavened. It will all rise. The leaven will go throughout the entire uh, dough. And the entire dough will rise. It will be spoiled. If it's sin, represent, the leaven representing sin here, the entire dough will be, become sinful. So just a little bit. doesn't take much. A little bit of false teaching. You've got all the Bible all right. But you believe in this once saved, always saved. I can do whatever I want to do. And one little false teaching, and you'll find yourself in the wrong place. So it says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubled you shall bear his own judgment whosoever he be. I have confidence in you that you're going to find the right way. That you're going to understand this is not about circumcision and uncircumcision. These are the things that we, you know, wrap our little minds around and we, we have a great time just having these arguments. You know, I, I, I talk to people all the, uh, you know, I've recently I've really been trying to talk to people about the kingdom of God. And everybody has an excuse why you don't want to go to church. You know, my mom, my, my grandmother said we never need to do that. But what does the word of God say? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves. What does the word of God say? Is it, is it going to be grandmother's word on the day of judgment? Or is it going to be the word of God? God left this beautiful love letter for a reason. Because he loves you. Because he wants you to be able to find eternal life. It would be terrible if he did not leave this book and went to a faraway country and left us here. We don't know where our, our um, etymology starts. We don't know where our origin came from. We don't know who we are. We don't know how we got here. We'd be very confused. But guess what, Joseph? 
We don't have to be confused. You know why? He left the book. He left the instructions. He left his word. He left his love. He told us that he's coming back. And he's coming back for a people who are looking for him, who are living for him in anticipation that he is coming back. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. So if I am preaching circumcision, he says, why do I yet suffer persecution? It's because he's preaching the truth. People want to hear about circumcision. People want you, they want, they want you know, they want an orthodox church. They want the Catholic Church because, you know, you can have indulgences. You can pay to do whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you want to, and then you can come to, con to the confession box. They want those type of things. But if you preach the truth, you're going to be persecuted. If you live the truth, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be judged as stupid and foolish and crazy. You're going to be told you're going to, well, better than being told, you're going to be taken advantage of. That's going to be the bottom line. There is a price. Then is the offense of the cross cease. There's always going to the cross. It's always going to bring offense. It's always going to be called a lie. It's always going to be called man's word. It's always going to be called hypocrisy. It's going to be called every name in the book. Because he said, I came to bring war, even in your household. The brother against the sister, the mother against the children. This Bible is always going to be in office because men hate truth. They love darkness. They want to do what they want to do. They don't want to know the truth because if they know the truth, then they're going to be responsible. But I came to tell you today that even if you deny the truth, the truth will still be what judges your life. We ought to know the law of the land, which is the word of God. This is what we will be responsible for. If you're going to be responsible, if you know there's going to be a test, and you know you're going to be responsible for the material. If I were you, I would study to show myself approved, a worker that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I would, he says in verse 12, I would, they were even cut off. What troubled you? Whoever is teaching you false doctrine, whoever, wherever this lie is coming from, that's come to condemn you, that's come to take you away from the truth, that's come to blind you. I wish, he said, I wish they'd be cut off, but they're cut off, that means like gone, dead, out of here, so that you would live. The source of the lie would be cut off so you would live. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Yes, you have been called to liberty. It is liberty when you can feel love, joy, peace. When you can feel patience and, and, and goodness and faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit operating in your life. That's liberty. When you can feel free. He who the Son set free is free indeed. Liberty. Only use not your liberty. Has an occasion to the flesh. You know, I have grace. I'm going to use my grace. I'm going to use my grace card. I'm going to do what I feel like doing. And then I'm going to pull out my grace card. Use not your grace card. As an occasion to the flesh, to satisfy the flesh. Because we're going to read in a couple of minutes what the flesh does. Don't use that grace card. For the flesh to do these things. But by love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. Walk in love. Be kind. Be gentle. Be patient with one another. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. Be good to one another. 
But all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love, love, love. Love takes a lot of dying. Unconditional love requires a lot of death. Because here God is asking us to love the loveless, to love those who you know are planning and scheming against you, to love those who are of a different mindset, of a, you know, who, those who are living in the flesh. You're called to love them. Those who have hurt you, those who have harmed you, those who have made themselves against you, you're still called to love. To love thy neighbor as thyself. To love thy neighbors as thyself. Those things that you want for yourself, that you would want them for someone else. And that's what we're called to do. For all the law, so instead of focusing on whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised or, you know, whatever rules there are in religion, he said, forget all about that. Love one another. Do right by other people. Be good to them. Be faithful to them. Be kind to them. Because God has given us love, joy, and peace, and we should be able to be patient, long-suffering, gentle, and all those, and meekness and all those things. That's what God expects from us. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. We're going to destroy each other. We're going to self-destruct as long as we're not operating in the love of God and we're operating in the flesh. Both sides will be devoured. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. There's warfare going on here. There's serious warfare. The flesh against the spirit. The spirit against the flesh. The flesh wants to do what it wants to do. The spirit wants the flesh to do what it wants to do. And, you know, I find this warfare even going on with, with people. We are spirit beings. But we love to dominate other spirits. And we don't quite understand that. You belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I don't belong to you. You don't belong to me. We belong to Jesus. We belong to the master. And we are to obey the master. And if we do what the master wants us to do, everybody will be in love. Everyone will show kindness to one another. We won't have to dominate each other. We won't have to control each other. We won't have to watch what each other is doing. We won't have to do none of that if we're all operating in the love of God. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary. They're against one another so that he cannot do the things that he would. You can't do the things that you would. There's such a warfare. You would like to do good, but evil is always present. You would like to be kind, but anger is always present. You'd like to um, do something for someone, but something else, bad motives are here. Something evil is always lurking in the flesh. But he, if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law and are manifest, which are these. See, now he's talking about the manifestation. Now the work of the flesh are manifest, which are these. This is the work of the flesh that is warring against the spirit. The spirit says, be ye husbands of one wife, wives, obey your husbands, submit yourselves to your husband, wives, be dutiful, be keepers at home, teach the right way to the younger women, but that's not what we want to do. So we commit adultery, we, we fornicate, we do whatever we want to do. So there's a warfare because the word says one thing and what the flesh, the body, wants to do 
and even even the soul has its desires, what it wants to do, how it wants to feel in our emotions. So fornication, uncleanness, unclean and, and all that uncleanness, unclean spirits find a place to lodge in sinfulness and lasciviousness, says of idolatry, witchcraft, um, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, envy, murders, drunkenness, reviling, and such a life of the witch. And all men are the same type of stuff. All this negative emotional stuff is coming from the flesh. All the reviling. You, you said this to me and I said this to you. That's reviling. Bickering, reviling. You know, coming at someone uh, with some, you did something nice for someone. Oh, and you, you're throwing it in their face. You're reviling them. And such a light. I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they would do these things. I'm not talking about they who slip up every once in a while and, and then repent to the Lord, but they don't have the Spirit of God. This is how they live. These are hard, habitual. These are things that they cannot control. They must envy. They must murder. They must drink. They must revile. They must have a riotous living. They must have wild sex. They must. They can't keep at home. They must fornicate. They must commit adultery. They must live in lasciviousness. They must do it because this is where they are. This is the mindset. This is where they are standing. Surely they can do right sometimes, but the mindset is continually back to what it said. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, which come from God. God gives us love, joy, and peace every single day, freely. When we partake in the word of God, it is our strength. He asks us to be long-suffering, gentle, and kind, and good with others. And as we do this, our faith grow, we become meek, we become temp temp well-tempered. And against such, there is no law. You can do this as much as you like. It will never be wrong. There will be no law that convict you that you are unrighteous. So when we begin to take the joy of the Lord into our own lives, then we can love. Then we can love the loveless. If we don't have the love of God in our lives, we can't even love our own selves. And we can't expect anyone who does not have the love of God going in their lives to love us. And that's just the way it is. This is the truth of God. We need the love of God. We need, these are the fruit of the Spirit. No matter what's going on in your life, you can have love, joy, and peace. And I do mean no matter what's going on in your life, you can have love, joy, and peace. Somewhere along the line, the love and the joy and the peace of God will keep your heart and mind. Because God gives that to us and he upbraided not. He gives it to us so liberally, even when we don't deserve it. And because of that, we can turn around and, and be uh, and, and be long-suffering with others. We could suffer a long time, no matter what they do to us. We can continue to suffer, continue to suffer years after years after years because of God's love and joy and peace is with us. We can still smile even if we're, we're suffering. We can still be gentle instead of mean-spirited. And we can still be good to other people and kind to them as long as we have the love and joy of God operating in our life. And this is, and after all of this happens in our lives, that's when faith shows up. So that's why I said the anointing, it's a process. It's a process. It takes time. It has to be de developed. It's a fruit. It has to grow. It has to mature. It has to become ripe and be ripe for the picking. And so the Word of God says, meekness 
temperance against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's, if you are, if you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, you will crucify your flesh with the affection and its lust. The flesh lusts. It has desires. It doesn't care about any laws. It doesn't care about any rules. It doesn't care what God says. The flesh is lusty. And it has affections. It loves the things that God says, leave alone. Don't do. That's what it loves. If God says, don't touch that fruit, that's the fruit we want to touch. If God says, obey my voice, that's the voice we want to ignore. If God says, go, we want to come. If God says, sit and listen, read my word. Oh, we pick up the word and immediately we want to sleep. Because that's the flesh. The flesh wants the war. It's an opposition. It's contrary to what God's word wants for us. But what God wants for us is what is best. It is where life is. It is where where life is, it, where the river of life is teeming with all kinds of beautiful things. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So if we say that we are spiritual beings, that the Holy Spirit live in us, that we are born again, walking in the spirit requires, because Jesus, uh, um, God said to Abraham in the Old Testament, walk before me and be perfect. Walk before me. That means follow my direction. Let my spirit lead you. When you are walking, you are going somewhere. You're headed to some destination. You could walk towards this way or you could walk towards Unrighteousness. You can go towards righteousness or unrighteousness. But he says, walk in the spirit. The spirit will lead you. If you lead yourself, I promise you, you will not land in the right place. But if you are led by the spirit, he will lead you to heaven. And he will lead you to God. And that's the only thing that we have that will show us the way to the Father is the Spirit of God in our lives, leading us. You can't have the Spirit in your life, and you've quenched the Spirit, you basically tied it up, told it to shut up, you know, put the gag order on it, put the blinders on it, and say, you stay here, because I, I know you, I know I have you, I'm going to take you into the bar houses. I'm going to take you into the whore houses. I'm going to take you to the drug house. I'm going to make you drink. I'm going to make you smoke. I'm going to make you do everything. You just stay right here in me and keep your mouth shut and do whatever I want you to do. Don't grieve the Spirit of God. Don't put the Spirit of God through things that you should not put it through because He is holy. He is the lead and not you. You need to retire from being the Holy Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. You need to retire from being in charge and let the Spirit of God take charge because the Word of God declares that He is bound to you until the day of redemption. Yes, you have the Holy Spirit, but when God said, what did you do with my, my spirit? And you said, I took it to the whorehouse. I took it to the lust house. I took it to the drug house. I took it to the fun house. I took it to the party. I took it where the girls are. I took it where the boys are. I took it where the fun is. He's going to say, depart from me. You work us up iniquity. I never knew you. I never had a chance to develop a relationship with you. I never had a chance to lead you because you bound me up and grieved me and kept me shut up. And I was never able to, to know you. So let not. So he said, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and being one another. So when we are walking in the spirit, 
we're going to operate towards one another in love. And this is why the flesh must die. And being able to choose what God wants and forgetting of, and I'm not talking by your power. I'm not talking about your brain. I'm not talking about your willpower. I'm not talking about that. Your will must die. Bottom line, your will, we got to get rid of your will and find out what does God want you to do. And without his Holy Spirit, you can't do it. I don't care how much you want to do it because evil is always present with us. We can't find a way to get it done. No matter what, how good we are, we will go in the darkness to do our wickedness. We will do it in secret. But God sees everything. So the best thing to do is to let your flesh die. Let your will die. And it is a process. And it can be painful. I didn't think it could be painful. But I'm finding out when I really want what I want. See, before, I, was, I thought I was doing the will of God. I thought I was doing it very well. But I'm finding out God requires more. Sometimes that beautiful house that you love so much that you just have to have. He wants it. Because that house, you're serving the house and not him. Sometimes that beautiful girl that you love so much that takes away all your time from being with him, he gets jealous. And your will got to die so he can live. Jesus has to manifest in our lives. If we're going to be Christ-like, Christ must live in us. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for everyone listening. I want to thank you, Lord God, for everyone who, who's able to endure sound doctrine. These might sound like harsh words, but these are the words of life. And Lord, we just thank you for manna from heaven. We don't want garbage. We want something that's going to touch our lives and change our spirits so that when we leave this place, that we could go and be in a good place, that place called heaven that's prepared for those who have made themselves ready for their Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Father God, I pray right now for everyone who's dealing with any type of strongholds, any type of lust, any type of spirits, oh God, that's preventing them from living the truth, from preventing them from being Holy Ghost filled. Every lie, every religious spirit, every spirit of witchcraft, every, everything, oh God. You know what they are. You know what the people need. You know what we are, who we are, and where we are individually, God. No one knows where any one of us are in particular because no one can read our minds and no one can read our hearts. But Lord God, you know everything. Nothing escapes you. Your word declares even if I made my bed in hell, you would be there. You would know what's going on with me. So God, you who search the heart and lay our reins in the balance in the morning, oh God, come into us. Take away from us, oh God, those things that are not pleasing to, that are not pleasing to you, God. And we'll be sure to give you the praise, the honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. Amen. amen. Can you pray for me? Yes, I am. My yes, 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 yes. Visit www.eternallifetv.com slash prophetess to watch The Fresh Fire with Prophetess Marilyn Fisher broadcast archive or watch on YouTube by searching Prophetess Marilyn Fisher. Don't forget to subscribe and like us and share. This is Marilyn Fisher. I want to thank you for watching. I really appreciate your support. Hugs and kisses. Till next time on the Fresh Fire Broadcast. See you soon.